It's a war. Veteran photojournalist Boris Primo, winner of over 200 Canadian and international awards. I've seen hatred. I've seen fear. I've seen so much suffering. As a child in Yugoslavia, Primo lost his family to the nightmare unleashed in 1939. There was no hope. No peacekeepers. Not in those days. From that time to the present, Primo has chronicled a world changing at lightning speed and skirting the tragedy of another final war. Yet smaller conflicts still rage on, checked only by the power of international scrutiny. People can't look the other way. Not anymore. That's why I like to communicate human emotions. That's why I photograph. From the horrors of war to the desolation of its aftermath, Canada has served with every major UN peacekeeping operation since 1947. More than 20 missions and 80,000 men and women over four decades. No other country shares that distinction. The challenge and the risk are beyond words. It's a tragic situation. Uh, the country's breaking down. There's always a possibility that something can happen. If someone was seriously hurt, we would bring them in here, stabilize them. We are required to wear uh, flak jackets. So in the event they crash, you know, whereabouts they might, might have gone down. The opposing forces are so close, and at times they try to antagonize each other. What we find is Canadian soldiers, which are right in the middle. Canada's peacekeepers, against the shadows of war, these faces of peace. Boris Primo on assignment to the hotspots of today's troubled world, putting a human face to one country's vision of global peace. Now, for the first time in my career, I have this chance to cover the way peace is made, to see how wars can end. I mean, uh, she knew that uh, it was just after a war and there'd be, uh, she knew that there'd be mines and explosives all over the place, and it was mainly, be careful. Uh, I want you to come back in six months. Coming to Kuwait after a wartime situation, it wasn't scary. I was quite nervous. I wasn't quite sure what to expect here, so I was a lot more scared coming here. So the goodbye to him that time around was a lot more difficult. She's accepted that I am in the military uh, and accepts that danger is part of my, my work, part of my profession. And uh, we really don't talk about it that much uh, because then she, she might think about it too much. I was excited uh, because this is uh, an old part of the world with an old problem and I wanted to be, in a small way, a uh, contributor to the solution. That might be naive, but that's the way I felt. The departure from Canada was, was a bittersweet moment. On one hand, I was leaving behind family, friends, which were very dear to me. But on the other hand, we were, when I say we, I mean not only myself, but my colleagues, we were going towards something of the unknown, perhaps an adventure. Definitely a purpose and an operation which was going to make a difference. And we're going to do something important. Yugoslavia, Europe's most brutal conflict since the Second World War. Thousands die and millions are left homeless as fighting rages among rival Serb, Croat, and Bosnian government. In 1992, the UN deploys a force to separate warring factions. 14,000 strong, it is the largest UN peacekeeping force ever. 1,400 Canadian troops take up positions. More will join later. Right now, it's uh, a lot of frustrations, but uh, in conjunction with that, with all those very many frustrations, uh, are particularly on the support and administrative side, because it takes time to get it started. It's really encouraging to see those contingents coming in from 29 different countries with the high quality of people that we're getting and getting stuck in and overcoming all the handicaps just to do the job. I put the Canadians at the top of that list. It is not long before the Canadians in Sarajevo are put to the test. Coming on a group of civilians hit by sniper fire, a Canadian sergeant risks his life to check for survivors. Although the first person is dead, next to the body is a woman still alive. She's rescued, as the sniper just 200 meters away continues to fire. Just another day for the peacekeepers who refuse to look the other way. 
she was confused. <laughs> Draghi Sin. Spacious. You saved my life. Here we've got one of the typical scenes uh, you can see among the soldiers in you know, a war zone. Uh, most emotional moment in their life when they receive a letter from home. Yeah, it must be. So some place they talk themselves. When my daughters were young, it was hard to make them understand. But I am an action photographer. It's closest to my heart. And I have to go where the news is happening. In Europe, in Africa, in Central America, in the Middle East, there are Canadian peacekeepers at this moment in just about every corner of the globe, more than any other time in history. Not many people know it, but peacekeeping is changing, the way it's done and the people who do it the best. Besides serving under the UN flag, Canadians also contribute to other multinational missions. In all, 83 Canadian peacekeepers have given their lives. It's never easy saying goodbye. At least my daughters are old enough now. They understand why I've got to go. I photograph war and peace, but peacekeeping is really story of the day. I've seen soldiers, battle tough soldiers, read letters and cry. That's how powerful they are. I remember the year I was in refugee camp. Those letters were all the moral food and mental food you get. All your hopes are in those letters. You're far away. That letter or picture brings home a little closer. The cottage roof is still leaking. I got I'd say the hardest thing day. was uh, saying bye to Valerie, and uh, she's 13 months old. She's just starting to say a couple of words. And then you phone back home uh, five, six months later, and uh, next thing you know, she's going uh, papa, and she's saying words. I wish I would have been there uh, when she said uh, papa for the first time. Uh, I'll be home eventually. <laughs> Have a great time then. The battle for Kuwait was an onslaught of unprecedented fury and high-tech destruction. Ravaged by the Iraqi invasion, then pounded in the Allied assault, the Gulf War left the wreckage of a living nightmare, a horror that for many lives on. When I look back on this mission, the first thing that will come to my mind is the, uh, the children. Uh, the children walking around no shoes, bare feet, running around begging for food and water. I'm going to remember uh, devastation after a war. Blown up buildings, blown up cars all over the place. I always remember what a war can do. Okay, what you have here is a BLU-97 anti-personnel mine. This parachute here, what it does is it pulls, it comes out like the, the air pulls a parachute out, and then your, your mine, your anti personnel mine is ignited. The problem that we have with these is um, they're dropped in the desert, and when it's real windy, the wind will hit the parachute, and it'll just carry them off. So one day you can go through a road, the road is clear, there's no mines on it. Then at night, it, uh, the wind, yeah. Picks up, just carries this right across the road, and it's in the middle of the road. You come driving, you drive over this. Guess what, buddy? Is boom. Along the demilitarized zone between Iraq and Kuwait, 
It's not the two enemies so much as their battlefield that is so far the prime concern for the peacekeepers. The desert floor is littered with unexploded mines and shells. Canadian military engineers are on hand to help dispose of them. As I'm approaching the bomb, there's a lot of things going through my mind because there's a lot of coordination which uh, has to be done because it's a 2,000 uh, pounder bomb, so there's a lot of roads which has to be blocked and there's a, a observation post which has to be evacuated. And also I have to look down on the, on the ground because there's a cluster bomb, the little bombs from uh, the containers that could be uh, anywhere, so I have to be very careful to, to do my approach. Well, the first time I've done something like that, I was very impressed to see some, uh, like, to see a bomb like that. 2,000 pounder bomb is like, it's a big, uh, it's a big bomb. And uh, there's a lot of things that go through your mind when you see that, that if that bomb goes off to your history. And, uh, but after a while, when you do it, do it again and again, then you get used to it. And uh, you don't want to be too confident about it, but uh, you know what it is and you know what to expect. There is no practical way to disarm a bomb this size under these conditions. It'll have to be detonated. Calling on years of specialized training, the disposal crew places an explosive charge around the nose section. Years ago, on another assignment, the jeep right in front of me hit a mine, blew up. Even Fodorov can't tell what it feels like. The smell, the earth shaking under your feet, your ears popping from the explosion. Once the charge is in place, sandbags are packed over the plastic explosive. This will direct the force of the explosion downward. Even though the crew has neutralized similar bombs, every job is different. Every step must be carried out precisely, exactly as planned. They know from their regular safety briefings just how real the danger is and how tragic the consequences. Only a week ago, a civilian bomb disposal expert was badly injured in an explosives clearing accident. The rest of the area already evacuated. The team retreats to a position several kilometers out of range. Ironically, this particular bomb was dropped by Allied aircraft, targeting an Iraqi troop position nearby. It had the destructive potential to wipe out everything within a one square kilometer. I was relieved that we completed another task safely. None of my men got injured. I don't want to be the one that has to phone Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so, uh, yes, uh, you've had an accident with your son. Uh, my job is security of my men, always. They work hard, and they play hard. The real enemy is boredom. They can't afford to get sloppy. It's no coincidence that off-duty activities for the peacekeepers are as fully scheduled as their duties on the job. It's also the reason they work a six-day week. More than one day off at a time can feel extremely long. It's doubly true in places like Kuwait. It's a totally foreign culture. Zero social life outside the base. Strict Islamic tradition forbids alcohol and severely restricts contact between unrelated women and men. It's a six-month tour. That's a long time. These guys away from Canada, they're like a big family. I miss my kids already, but how do they feel? Sports help to keep the team sharp, help to keep their spirits up, and help to keep their minds off home. An army uh, would shrivel in its, in its outlook would have great difficulty in keeping itself up to date and current without rubbing shoulders with other armies to see how they do things. There are eight nationalities serving here in Umpacific. Canadians can see 
how the other seven nations go about doing their business. And although we're good, you can always learn a little bit from somebody else. That's my favorite part of the whole thing, interacting with people in Spanish, Fijian. You know, you learn how to say hello in 10 different languages by the time you leave, if you put any effort in at all. I think just because they're all thrown into this environment, very eclectic environment, they're all here to uh, learn about each other. That, that binds them a lot, the very fact that they see people from other cultures, other countries, where stereotypes used to be rampant. Now it's not the Canadian from the north. There's an actual person behind that Canadian. It's not the stereotypical American, perhaps. It's, hey, that guy's a really nice guy. He's a doctor. The Colombian's the dentist. It's, uh, it brings a, uh, an element of realism to the environment of the nations. In the mission, and that is the chief of staff, who is not considered... There is a very important thing that has made the UN probably the UN's only real strength, and that is cross-cultural, cross-linguistic capability. And it's a tolerance of people's linguistic and cultural differences. If you become hostage to one language, one culture, one way of thinking, you will, by definition, oppress or put down other minorities. I think it's something we learn in Canada very quickly, that we have linguistic differences, and we must actually learn to live with them and tolerate them, and maybe in some ways celebrate them, rather than try and eradicate them or suppress them. I never barge like a crazy tourist to the environment of people where I am. I usually go first and introduce myself and take my time. And when I feel a trust, that's when I start shooting pictures. The war is full of conflicts, full of the haters. And somebody has to step between them and make the peace. The swirl of cultures, religions, and ideologies in the Middle East has given rise to a bitter history of attack and retaliation, revolt and entrenchment. I think peace in the Middle East will be very hard to achieve. That's my feeling. It's like a cancer. You cure it in one place and it appears in another. No international issue is more complex or more dangerous to world security than the Arab-Israeli conflict. And no other issue has claimed more peacekeeping effort. The two communities have fought six full-fledged wars, each claiming historical ties to the same relatively small pieces of land. The UN's very first mission still active today is headquartered here in Jerusalem, called UNSO, the Truce Supervision Organization, it was formed by the UN mediator for Palestine in 1948 to monitor truces between Israel and its Arab neighbors. Jerusalem uh, is a unique city. It's uh, the home, in a lot of senses, to three major world religions. Uh, Christianity, Judaism, and uh, Islam. And each of the three religions hold this city very dear to them. And that, for a United Nations uh, peacekeeper, uh, complicates matters. Uh, because this city is, in some sense, a universal city. Everybody has some sort of claim to Jerusalem. Over the years, UNSO has gained a wealth of peacekeeping expertise, so much so the UN often dispatches officers trained here to set up short-notice missions in other conflict areas. Kuwait and Yugoslavia are two. The first lesson for the peacekeepers, and sometimes the hardest, is putting aside their own expectations. I say to myself that from time to time when things get hectic, that remember that you're in the Middle East and this isn't Canada and uh, things don't happen here the way we would like them to happen, or as they would happen in Canada, and you have to accept that. Uh, something that would take 10 minutes to accomplish in Canada may take a day to accomplish here. It takes us about two and a half hours to fly from Jerusalem to Amman because we have to fly out of Israeli airspace, uh, into international airspace, 
and then north again into Amman. So a flight that would normally take 18 minutes takes us over two hours. Of all the borders uh, that Israel has with its Arab neighbors, it's uh, pretty well acknowledged that this is the most dangerous and active. Observer Group Lebanon patrols the disputed northern border between heavily armed Israeli and Lebanese-based units. The group also mans the isolated observation posts that dot the critical route. Despite the constant level of tension, though, this is an unarmed mission. It seems strange to me. We are all wearing these blue flag jackets wherever we go in Lebanon. But our guys aren't even carrying guns. It's safer when both factions know the peacekeepers are not armed. Since they're not a threat, no one targets them, at least not directly. What is your name? Nobody is really safe. These kids growing up in barbed wire, terrorist attacks, bombing raids. It's a miracle they still smile. Do you, do you have no matter where they are, all these kids, they live innocently. They're too young to hate. They're the easiest to photograph. They're natural, they're honest, and they're themselves. Tragically, turmoil in the Middle East has become for many an accepted fact of life. Canadians with Observer Group Lebanon are trying to help reverse that perception. Their work very much relies on the local goodwill. When we go on uh, mobile patrols, we are looking for any changes in the area uh, that we can observe. Um, changes in the attitude of the, the people that might indicate something is wrong. And it's very evident if something has happened uh, by their attitude. The Lebanese people are very friendly towards the United Nations. Every bunch of people we meet uh, will wave, smile. Uh, the first English words they, they learn are, hello and how are you? So it's a very good indicator of if something's wrong, if this does not happen. We observe and report uh, all kinds of activity, but generally an observer observes and does not become part of the problem. When you're faced with uh, rounds coming down close, or an actual armed confrontation that's already starting, where negotiation has kind of failed in this instance, then we retire quietly to our shelters, wait for that particular situation to calm down again, and then start our job all over. It's a real waiting game on an observation post. Uh, you will have weeks of looking with nothing to look at really except the fence. And then all of a sudden, you will have moments of excitement uh, where you think it's all coming to a head and the whole world is collapsing around you. Uh, it is not easy to remain objective. And it's not easy to relax that objectivity so that you can gain the confidence of the individual without prejudicing it, without losing it entirely. It's a fine line. We tread it as carefully as we can. Uh, lab, this is 339er in convoy. Echo 1, over. The closest that exists among the members in our infantry battalion is really hard to describe. It's a good feeling of belonging to, to a, a unit, belonging to, to a group of people who have not only a common purpose, but also who are interested in the same things and who want to achieve the same things. It's very comforting to know that you have people that you can depend on and count on when times are good and when times are bad. From my own point of view, the, the six months that I, that I spent with the soldiers uh, doing the, the frontline tasks 
was, was the most enjoyable. I think all soldiers will say that. To be with troops, to be with other soldiers doing the job is the most enjoyable and the most rewarding, most challenging, of course. Friendship. Because I found in Cyprus and here that the friendships that you make during this time period is a lot better than the ones back home because you're thrown in a small area together and you have to work together to survive. It's a United Nations policy to encourage female participation in peacekeeping forces. And the, the communities are grateful to have them there. Um, when there are demonstrations, when I need every person in the force to control a situation, females come out with their weapons and, and stand shoulder to shoulder with, with the men of the force. The Golan Heights is a high, windy, rocky plateau overlooking the Sea of Galilee. Here, Canadians help supervise the fragile ceasefire between Israel and Syria. One of the things I was told when I was coming here was you're going to Golan Heights, you lucky guy. Golan Heights, and I said, yeah, Golan Heights. Probably a vacation place, uh, probably a bathing suit and stuff. When I got here, it wasn't called Golden Heights. The camp itself is called Camp Zuani. Sounds a little bit like a, a prison of some sort, and in a way it is. You're surrounded by a fence. You're surrounded by tank ditches. You're surrounded by watchtowers, radars, patrols from the Israeli Defense Force going back and forth. And uh, your camp itself is segregated from all of that. During the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Syria tried to retake the Israeli-occupied Golan Heights, but Israeli armored columns struck back, advancing to within 40 kilometers of Damascus before a ceasefire could be arranged. UNDAF, the UN Disengagement Observer Force, was set up to monitor that agreement. The peacekeepers were greeted by a wilderness of shell-pocked villages and the debris from two savage wars. Who lives here? Where are they now? That's what the bullet riddle walls and the silence say to me. A family. Their whole life all gone. The UN-sponsored calm along the Golan was again shattered in 1991 when Saddam Hussein aimed Iraqi Scud missiles at Israel, the flight path directly overhead. The uh, alert measures that we had to take and the timing of uh, the reaction to those measures was such that we became very tired. And the, uh, the subtlety of uh, Hussein's attacks uh, was not uh, missed on us because in the nights that we weren't under direct threat, uh, we were waiting for the alarms. So we became very tired over the course of six or seven weeks. But each day, we naturally had to provide the logistic support that we are tasked to do. So we had to get on with the daily business on each and every day, and knowing full well that uh, what was ahead of you was probably a sleepless night. The Gulf War was a dramatic reminder to the world, but the cycle of violence and death is far more often unreported and too often forgotten. The, in the incident that comes to mind is one that happened about three weeks ago, where we went on this patrol road and came back and there was no problem. We were told, though, to stay on that road and inside our vehicle. The next day, on the same route, uh, at one of the checkpoints, a little girl stepped on an anti-personal mine and uh, she died. She was 10 years old. That kind of thing brings you back uh, to reality really quickly, because you know very well it'll never happen in Canada. Okay, guys, we'll have now group shots. We call family portraits. Over here, we deal with not only first line, second line, but we also handle third line repairs. Okay, that's good. Okay. In other words, we don't only pull the engines. My boys lay them out, put them back together. Now, I think we got everybody organized. All smiley faces, happy. Now, a little bit more on your right, okay? That's good. That's too much now. A little bit over here. Okay, that's good. There's a lot of jury rigging See, done. I have to arrange it proper a because... A lot of uh, expertise has to be relied on. And if these kids don't have that much when they get here, they have it when they go home.
think the the most important quality essential for a peacekeeper is is honesty diplomacy patience to be realistic maturity you have to be extremely flexible self-confidence be tolerant a sociable person somebody who likes people you must uh, have a soldier who has a lot of self-discipline and he has to be friendly which is a trait that soldiers aren't asked to display in, in normal circumstances when we train in Canada for war for this fictional enemy that we don't know anymore who it is with the uh, re recent events um, and then all of a sudden somebody says to you well you're off the hook for a while now you're going on a UN peacekeeping mission it, it seems very nice but when you come into the area it's not so you are in the middle of a war zone so I think that my training for war is pretty much complete after a UN mission. UNFICEP, the UN peacekeeping force in Cyprus, is Canada's largest long-standing peacekeeping commitment. For years, the island's Greek and Turkish communities have been locked in a bitter ethnic struggle. The first Canadians arrived in 1964. The Blue Berets have been here ever since. Today, Cyprus is an island divided. A 200-kilometer no-man's land, the infamous Green Line, splits the country known to history as the Island of Love. To the north, the Turkish minority. To the south, the Greek majority, uprooting thousands of Cypriots in the process. The anger has yet to cool. In the city, uh, the problem is that the fact that the two lines between the Tur Turkish Cypriot and the Greek Cypriot are very close. Uh, at the most, uh, it would be 20 meters apart. What makes me feel perhaps sad about the situation as it is, the Cyprus problem as it is right now, is the, is the fact that the potential of this island and what it could do if the problem was resolved um, is being wasted. And unfortunately, because of the problem as it, is ex as it exists now, there is ant antagonisms between both sides the full potential of the people that live on the island is not being, uh, is not reaching its maximum. That's, where, that's very sad. The buffer zone partitioning Cyprus is an armed and hostile border. Frozen in time, not one sandbag can be moved without heated debate from both factions. Neither will risk any change in the status quo. At observation post uh, Charlie 45, the buffer zone where we have the separation between the op opposing forces is very stark. Uh, it's a very stark contrast to any other part of the city. We have a series of barrels which almost look like uh, the Berlin Wall. The situation at Charlie 45 at times is very tense. The uh, opposing forces are very close together, and the Canadian peacekeepers who are manning these positions find themselves in very you know, serious situations. The other day I had uh, Turkish Cypriot aiming and uh, cocking his weapon at one of my, uh, my soldier. And my soldier has to lay down because that guy, probably a recruit, was not aware of the rules. Here in Rural Company we have several dangers that, uh, that face the local population that do have access to the buffer zone. One of the major ones is mines. We still have active minefields in the buffer zone, as per se, and what happens often is that we'll have farmers or shepherds that will come through the buffer zone, and we have to continually warn them not to. One incident in particular, which took place in 1979, was a farmer who did not heed our warnings and tilled the soil with his tractor. The, the, what happened from this was that his uh, tractor blew up after having struck a mine. Regardless of this, we still have trouble today where um, the shepherds with their herd of goats still come through the minefields and ignore our warnings. You, you know that there are mines, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Each time there is always that shepherd who go every day in the minefield, but I keep telling him that that's a dangerous area and he still don't believe me. And you see, I, I have proof I can I can show him that there are mines but and uh, still he does not believe me
Tensions on Cyprus reached a peak in 1974. An attempted coup by Greek Cypriot nationalists was quashed by a full-scale invasion from the Turkish mainland. The peacekeepers were caught in the middle. Even today, they are still reminded of incidents from that crisis. One occurred here on the Padeus River. During a skirmish between Greek and Turkish Cypriots, two Canadian peacekeepers came under heavy fire. One was seriously wounded. When the other went to his aid, he too was shot. They survived, but two more Canadians were later killed and 17 wounded before order was restored to the island. When I was here in 1975, there was a lot of tension on the ceasefire line. We had the shots fired many times a day. When I was back in 1979, we had still some shots fired on the line, but more on a weekly basis. Today, we have almost none. So on that aspect, there has been a lot of improvement. There's a better willingness to respect the ceasefire on both sides involved here in Cyprus. Almost 30 years they've been here, and still no end in sight. The politicians have some hard decisions to make. People are saying, it's time the UN moved on to other conflicts. Till then, the peacekeepers on Cyprus wait and watch. Canada, as we know, is not a superpower. Although Canada is uh, really uh, trying to, uh, to influence the world community, uh, in order to achieve peace, stability, and security throughout the world. It, it's not sufficient to just be self-satisfied. It would be unfair, I think, of, of Canada to sit back and say, we've got it made, we can gloat. I think it's in the self-interest of Canada to be out here uh, doing this. I think there's also a fact that uh, if you wish to be a member of the world society, you have to contribute to the world society. El Salvador plagued by civil war. A bloody struggle pitting 8,000 guerrillas against government forces numbering over 60,000. All in a country smaller than Nova Scotia. National troops and a corrupt police force earn a reputation for ruthless, savage tactics. Public opposition crystallizes in a demonstration following the shooting of Archbishop Oscar Romero, killed as he celebrated Mass in 1980. Of the thousands who take to the streets, 40 are killed and many more injured when government forces open fire. Before its end, the war will cost some 75,000 Salvadoran lives. The situation when we started here was a situation of a porcupine that has walked into a fishing net. Lots and lots of spikes sticking into many, many uh, threads of, and, and sections of the net. And what we're doing is watching as each thread, uh, each spike is disentangled and disengaged and moved further and further apart so that they're safe from each uh, other. 202309. It was a very, very complex, uh, intertwined situation to start with, and we're, we're watching it and verifying that it's becoming clearer and clearer and more and more consolidated. The UN's main job is ensuring that both sides, the Salvadoran army and guerrilla fighters, comply with the terms of the new peace accord. A key item is demobilization. The rebels will disband and government troops will be cut by half. The police force will be rebuilt and agricultural land redistributed. But with years of war just behind them, each side is highly suspicious of the other. That's where the UN comes in. Both okay. groups two, trust eight, the expertise one. of the peacekeepers, two, two, responsible one, for weapon inventories and troop counting. For these young guerrillas, it's their only real hope. I've had some interesting experiences uh, watching the FMLN out in the field, and I'd like to tell you one little story about uh, some FMLN. So we were at a landing zone, and a couple of sections of FMLN troops came to secure the landing zone and to, to sweep the area. And one of the sections that I was observing consisted of uh, three teenage uh, males and two teenage females. And they went off and they, they conducted their security check of, of one perimeter of the, of the landing zone. 
They did it very uh, professionally. Yes, yes. They did it very thoroughly. Um, and then when they came back to report to the uh, officer in charge of the area that they had uh, done their security check and that the, the landing zone was safe, the two girls took off their rifles, took off their packs and started fixing each other's hair. And for me, this summed up the entire situation. Uh, there you had a couple of teenage girls, like anywhere, were interested in fixing each other's hair and getting it started up. But when they were called upon to do their duty, they had their rifles, they knew how to do it, they knew how to clear a landing zone. And that is what these people were all about. Like uh, uh, one row down, you know, like that, with, with rifles and uh, one row standing and one... Okay. Just like a... They're so young, these rebels. Some of them only 10. Already veterans of 14. I can't help but think of my own kids. They're so lucky. They've got everything. These kids have nothing. But they believe in what they're doing. The village of Awakayo is, is almost, to me, is like a monument uh, to this war. It's a village that used to have three to 4,000 uh, campesinos who lived there and got caught up in the offensive that the army did in 81 which was a scorched earth policy. They literally leveled the village. The church, which is always at the center of town, is completely uh, devastated, although inside the ruins you can see still the font, incredibly, is there uh, for the baptisms were held. The village itself is in reconstruction. Uh, Salvadorians are very small people. You can see them today struggling away, uh, taking the wood and the roofing to rebuild their village. These people have been refugees in Honduras, and now they've come back to rebuild their village. For Salvadorans, rebuilding will be a daunting task. Not just the physical reconstruction, but recreating the very institutions that lead to war in the first place. The army, the police. That's why this UN mission is a three-part operation. It involves military peacekeepers, police, and human rights observers, all working together towards a more accountable and democratic system, a social order that for Canadians is second nature. Being a uh, peacekeeper here in Central America is, almost, is a natural role for Canadians. The Americans uh, are involved in all aspects of either one side or the other side, so that they're not a, an acceptable uh, mediator, if you will. And for the uh, Canadian, is very acceptable. He's part of the Americas. Um, they refer to us as American brothers, if you will. So I think uh, Canadians seem to understand the culture. And doing that, we, we instantly have a rapport with both sides. I think that Salvador is the absolute key to Central America for a number of reasons. If Salvador reduces its armed forces, there's less uh, reason for suspicion on the part of its neighbors. It borders both Guatemala and Honduras, and therefore there must be pressure on both of those countries to be able to reduce their armed forces. If Salvador diverts uh, resources that have been going into the armed forces into the economy and becomes a powerhouse, and many analysts have talked about Salvador being able to be a Hong Kong or a Taiwan of Central America, that will be an economic spur, a pump to the entirety of Central America. So in economic, social example and political terms, Salvador is the key to Central America. If it works here, it can work anywhere in Central America. If it fails here, it's a very bad uh, sign for the rest of Central America. Conceptually, it's very, very exciting working in something that is not the old style, traditional, uh, and in some respects, uh, rather a failure of peacekeeping in the past, because if you think about it, of the traditional peacekeeping missions, very few have been shut down. Very few have been able to be closed off and said, we've finished here. So this part of the world, is, it is very optimistic and very exciting to be part of, as it were, a new wave where things can be done, and you can see that the UN could withdraw eventually. When I have further, I think, uh, certain cases like wars, accidents, or where is the human drama, I can't get emotionally involved because as soon as you get emotionally involved, you don't do proper job anymore. Just can't. 
But when I go back to darkroom, and when I develop my film, when I now look at the details, because now the time for me to, to see what I have done, that's when I really hit you. Nine out of ten casualties in modern warfare are civilians. Most never wore a uniform, never carried a gun. All this bloodshed, all these victims, somebody's got to step in and stop the killing. It was Canada that stepped forward in 1956 with the specter of Third World War over the Suez. Lester Pearson introduced the forerunner for UN peacekeeping missions to follow. I remember after the Suez crisis, when Lester Pearson won the Nobel Prize. I was a young photographer then. It's a different world now, a better world. People see, and they care. Any na nation that, that is well off, that is stable in itself, should not sort of just look internally, it should look externally and see what it can do, what it can offer. Canadians took special pride again in 1988 with another Nobel Prize, this one to UN peacekeepers themselves around the globe. It would be nice if, if the military of the different countries of the world would concentrate on, on peacekeeping instead of rearming. Maybe peacekeeping is the wrong word. It has been argued that Canada has never really kept the peace. We have only had it on loan. But in a shrinking world, even borrowed peace is an investment in a distinctly Canadian vision of harmony among nations.